Assalamualaikum everyone. May the peace and blessings of God be upon all of you. Um, I was traveling up here today from London. Well, I actually didn't actually come from London today, but I came from Rossingdale near Manchester. But before that, I came from London. But on my way up, I was thinking, who on earth would want to come and spend their Sunday listening to some Muslims talking and whinging about how some people want to burn their book? I mean, that fascinates me. Why would anyone spend their Sunday? I mean, I know why I'm here, and I'll, maybe I'll share it with you. If a few of you are going to share with me why you're here today, because I'm really curious to know. So I, there's a gentleman I've been looking at you, look so glum, you look so sad. I'm wondering, why did you come here today, sir? Why did you come here? Curiosity. Huh? Curiosity. Curiosity. Are, you, are you a Muslim? Why not? Okay, and is that, why did you come? Yeah, curiosity, yeah? Curiosity, what did curiosity do? Uh, <laughs> why are you here, Dave? No, what, no, I, what, I know, I got, uh, just the uniform, it's, uh, why are you here today? Because I was invited. You had to come? No, I didn't have to come. But I was invited and I was... It was politically correct to come? No, no, I was invited and I was interested to support the community. Great, so you wanted to come? Yes, yeah, so I was quite happy to go, yes. And how about the gentleman next to you? Uh, I, I came here because I, I don't know anything at all about the Muslim faith, and I wanted to find out why you believe in your faith. Wow, fantastic. Good. Now that's a good start. Let me ask some Muslims why they're here today. Let's ask some Muslim women. They do, they do speak, actually. They do have a voice. I, I hope I pick the right one. So... Uh, sister over here, yes, yeah, but, uh, she's been pointed out to me, ask this one. Sister, why are you here today? Because um, I think it was interesting to see um, how many Muslims would be supporting the whole issue that the Quran was burnt, and, you know, to educate other people about um, what the Quran is about, basically. Excellent. So are you, you happy with the turnout? Um, Alhamdulillah, yeah. Good. How about you? Yeah, why are you here today? Why did you come? To find out more about Islam and other people's views. Are you a Muslim? Yeah. Why? Because that's what I believe in. That's what you believe in? Okay, that's good. I came partly because my long, long old friend Abu Taib over here is a man I trust. And he does good work. He does some really good work. And if he asks me to come up, I know it's because he's made a real effort and it's important to him. That's one reason I came up here. But the other reason is, it's to do with the fact that I really care about this country. I really care about our communities. And I really, really care about how people think about Islam in England. That's why I'm here. Because I really, really want Islam to become part of English life. I really do. I don't, and I don't want Islam to have to change. I don't want us to have to compromise our religion. But I do want Islam to be seen as an integral, normal part of British life. And I don't think that's an impossible dream. I don't think it's something that can't happen. Because when I hear politicians and thinkers and people in the media and professors and, and you hear people talking about the Judeo-Christian tradition. Have you heard that term quite a lot? The Judeo-Christian tradition? I can almost guarantee, although I have not done a research on it, and maybe I will, that this phrase is a very new phrase. You will not find Judeo being included as part of British tradition a hundred years ago. Jews were not considered part of being Britain. They weren't considered part of being British. In fact, they had a status that is very similar as 
Abu Taib actually mentioned, very, very similar to the sort of almost pariah status of Muslims today. But things have changed a lot. So things can change, things can be different. It's interesting even that the right wing groups that we've been talking about, you know, the BNP certainly make an effort to show that they're not anti-Jewish and not anti-Semitic. We, we've moved on from that now, you know. That's what they say. And maybe it's true, maybe it's not, but it's interesting that they feel they have to say that. So I believe, how, how do I think we can make a difference? I think we can make a difference by talking to each other. I think talking to each other is the key. When you, you tend, people tend to be afraid of the things they don't understand. I know it's a cliche, but I think it's a really true cliche that people are afraid of things they don't understand. Because they don't understand it, they're afraid of it. When it's strange, when it's different, it makes anything strange and different makes a person feel uncomfortable. Add to that that it may seem intimidating, threatening, it makes you more uncomfortable. But when you begin to understand, why does a person think like that? Why does a person behave like that? Why does this person do what they do or not do what they don't do? What motivates them? Now with that understanding comes something that I really try to teach a lot. I try to imbibe it into my family and the people who I get to sometimes give lectures to Muslims. A very important word that is linked to a very key state of being, it's called empathy. Empathy means being able to appreciate how another person feels. Being able to put yourself in their shoes and think how they are thinking. Empathy is very, very important. And I believe human beings are naturally empathetic. They are naturally like that. I don't believe it's the survival of the fittest. I don't believe in the selfish gene. I don't believe that what drives us is competition, reproduction, and survival. No. I think the reality of the human condition shows that that is false. How then is a human being ready to sacrifice his life for a complete stranger? Explain it to me. How do you explain to me a man falls on a railway track and he, there's another man standing with his two kids, the train comes, he die, and this man is having a fit and another man, a total stranger, dives on top of him to protect him from the train. A total stranger even leaves his kids there. How do you explain that? How does the selfish gene explain that? How does the idea that all we're about is reproduction explain that? No, there's something much more profound about the human being. And therefore, I, I do want to try and explain why the Qur'an means so much to Muslims. And I'm going to do that by also trying to very simply explain what Islam is about. What Islam is about. And hopefully I'll be able to link it up all together in the short time that I've got. Um, first of all, I want to ask you, if I say the word submission, just the word submission, what do you think? The word submission, does that have a negative or a positive emotional connection? When I say the word submission, what do you think? Negative or positive? Huh? If I say submission, what do you think? Is that a negative thing or a positive thing? Just generally, if I ask you, just totally honestly, I want you to be honest. Is it negative or positive? Yeah? Huh? It's positive to you? Okay. But I, I think, would you think generally in British society, the word submission, what do you think? Most people would say it's positive or negative. Almost universally it's negative. I, I believe almost, not everyone, but most people have a negative association. So when a Muslim says Islam means submission, and why by the way is it negative? Why? 
because we believe that we live in a free society. Right? We believe we live in a free society. So if a Muslim comes along and says, well, we believe in submission, Islam means submission. Well, the person saying, well, you believe in submission, I believe in freedom, so why would I be interested in submission? It's, it's generally a negative thing. However, let's, let's actually examine this concept, and we'll get to the Quran and how it fits in in a minute. Every society, every society throughout history is trying to find a balance between two competing and almost paradoxical, maybe contradictory ideas. Number one is individual freedom. Most of us would agree that it's good for an individual to be free. True or not? As an idea, it would be great if we could all be free to do whatever we liked. True or not? As a concept, we all, the idea of freedom appeals to us. That's why it's very emotive. Freedom, free society, this is a, you know, because we love the idea of freedom. But on the other hand, we also realize that you can't leave individuals free to do whatever they like. True or not? Can, can we leave individuals to be free to do anything they like? We asked the policeman. What do you, <laughs> you can't leave people free to do... You can't, can you, right? There has to be some restriction. In order to protect society, so we limit the freedom of the individual in order to protect society. That's it. But the, here's the question. Where is the limit? Who draws the line? Who says and who decides when the limit of the individual ends in order to protect the society? Where does it begin? Where does this one begin and this one end? This is the big question, right? For many years, I used to go down to Speaker's Corner. Uh, in Hyde Park in London and I would give speeches there about Islam and one of the things that I was often challenged on was the issue of Muslim women's dress and I was a uh, you know I mean in speakers corner you don't have much room except for rhetoric and you know sort of making your point strongly it wasn't it's not a place for a subtle nuanced discussion with someone you know you stand up and you have to shout but anyway so the point is is that I was being challenged about, so there was a particular, particularly vocal young American girls, you know, talking about Muslim women and the way they dress and this and that and whatever. And so I just, I changed the frame with them. I said to them, okay, I've got a challenge for you. Take off all your clothes and walk down naked throughout the park. So then they stopped, they were quiet. I said, you won't do it, will you? No. He said, I have to tell you something, by the way, that if you did that, you would be arrested. You would be arrested for indecency. So you're not free to dress or undress any way you like. There are still rules in this country about how much a woman can show. And by the way, what a man can show and what a woman can show, even in this country, are different. It's different. I can walk down the street with just my shorts, right, and nothing on my top. If a woman walked down the street with nothing except her shorts, she would be taken away. Why? Because the woman is not like the man. There's something different. Now my question is, who decides how much is covered? Who decides how much is decency? Who decides how much we should show and how much we shouldn't show? Here's, that's the really important question. Who makes that decision? I don't think it's necessarily a democratic one. But the point here, and the very important, important point is, no, we do have some standards. They may be different standards, but we have some standards. And we recognize even that there is a difference between men and women. But the point that the Muslim, and this comes to the Quran, you see, we would claim from our perspective 
that when human beings decide to impose upon other human beings their idea of where these limits are. I think this is right and this is wrong. I think this is good and this is evil. I think this is what you should eat and what you shouldn't eat, what you should dress and what you shouldn't dress, what you should drink and what you shouldn't drink, what you should smoke and what you shouldn't smoke, or whatever it may be. And you leave that decision to human beings. Uh, we believe as Muslims that actually human beings are incapable of making those decisions and getting the right balance. Yes, we can make the decisions, but can we get the balance right? The problem is, is that human psychology and human society is so sophisticated, so complicated. The interaction between human beings is so sophisticated and complicated. Our perspective, the Islamic perspective is that actually we can't get that balance right. And when we try, we always end up with prejudice. We will have one group of people trying to impose their ideas. Let's take, for example, the idea that we've heard about the media. Abu Tayyib talked about the media. The media is very, very powerful in making you think. Think about it. Why do people dress the way they do? Why do they wear this type of shirt, this type of dress, this type of makeup, this type of haircut? I'll give you an example. My wife bought a dress last year for 46 pounds from a designer. This designer happens to be the person who designs clothes for Kate Middleton. Who you know now who Kate Middleton is, right? Okay, she's, you know, she's going to be marrying Prince William, right? And my wife, now since the announcement of the engagement, my wife's a, a fanatic eBayer, right? She put this dress on eBay. Take a guess how much she sold, sold that. And she mentioned designer to Kate Middleton in her very clever advertising thing. Guess how much she sold her dr the dress for? Take a guess. Huh? No, not that much. But she doubled it. A hundred, no, more than doubled it. 146 pounds. That's, that's a, just... So think about it. How, what made people think that this dress was worth buying? This is the influence and the power of the media. But isn't the media responsible for selling us things? Doesn't most of the revenue of the media come from advertising? And the advertising is encouraging us, buy this, buy that, have this, have that. What does that say about the way we are being taught to think or perhaps not think as a society? It's quite scary if you allow yourself to sit down and ponder over that, those influences. These are the things that are now controlling what we think is right, what we think is wrong, what we think is you know, appropriate, what we think is inappropriate. And I was listening to a program and they were talking about, you know, you always hear about film artists, want, they always want to push the limits. Push the limits. And I was thinking, push the limits. Push the, how far are you going to push the limits? You know, before, a ma in film, a man and a woman in the 1940s, they were not allowed to sit on a bed together. They're not even allowed to sit on a bed. And then they sat on the bed. Yeah? And then they moved a bit closer. And then they kissed each other, right? And now it's full-on frontal nudity. And it's, it's there. It's basically pornography. And I think, and, and they want to push the limits. What's the next limit? Bestiality? What's the next limit? Torture? What's, well, we've already done that now. We, th there's no limits. And this is the stuff that we end up watching. This is the stuff our kids end up watching. And it has no influence. It doesn't affect. Who dares say it doesn't influence and doesn't affect? Why do they spend millions of pounds advertising if what you see on the TV doesn't affect you? Push the limits, push the limits. What, what's, to me, it's just incredible. And if you think about it, then there are no limits. And that's why we would say you need a book from God. And it has to be from God. If you don't have your morals anchored in a transcendental reality or in God, 
let's just say, if you don't have your morals anchored in something that comes from God, why God? Because the concept of God as a concept, it's unchangeable. God knows everything, God sees everything. His wisdom is perfect, his knowledge is complete. And it's something therefore that should be unchanging, that shouldn't be messed around with. Only God ultimately can have that effect. And if you think about it, if you don't have your morality anchored in such a concept, whether it's the Bible, whether it's the Quran, whatever it may be, if you think about it deeply, you will realize that you have no real morality because you can always push the limits. Where is the limit? Who decides what the limit is? If you think about it, there is ultimately no limit. And that's why we believe that it is so, so important. The Quran is not, you see, it's not only, it's not only, you see, today to talk to people about religion, to talk about God, it's also abstract. You know, it's so accepted that, you know, your religion is your own personal thing. And it doesn't really affect your life that much. This is a, such a common statement. I'm not saying that everyone's like that, but it's so common. Religion is a personal thing, as if, I don't know, it's just like some chat you have with God every now and then, or, or maybe not even that. I don't know what they mean by it's a personal thing and you shouldn't really bring it into public life. But this idea of religion is so removed from what Islam teaches. The Quranic concept, and I believe the concept that all the prophets taught, the, 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 the concept of Jesus, of Moses, of Abraham, of all the monotheistic faiths, is that no, religion is your life. It's not just a part of your life, it is your life. It dictates what you believe is right and wrong, what you believe is good and evil, what you believe is appropriate and inappropriate. And you can't push the boundaries of that because that's God you're talking about. You're talking about God. You can push the boundaries of God. How arrogant is that for a human being, a little human being, we are specks on a planet that is a speck in a universe that is a speck. As the, as the Prophet Muhammad described, the universe is like a ring in the desert before the throne of God. Imagine that, a ring in the desert. And we human beings, with our limited reason, we're going to say and think that we know better than God? No. This itself is a type of madness, we would think. So this is very important. The, Quran, the Muslim's life is rooted in the Qur'an. That's where we get our criterion by which we judge. And that's what we believe a truly moral successful harmonious society must be rooted in something like that in something like that it's essential for successful societies and indeed successful individuals so this is the concept of submission and if you think about it we all submit to someone or something all of us submit think about it for example ask the police officer what well, you're wearing a uniform why do you wear the uniform? Huh? So you can be identified. Do you like your uniform? Huh? The, I'm, I'm talking about the actual, put, let's put it this way. If you walked into Topshop, yeah, and you saw your uniform hanging up there, would you say, oh, that's what I'm going to wear this Saturday night? You know, it's like... It wouldn't be my choice. It, <laughs> who, wore, who wore a school uniform when they went to school? Hands up who wore school uniform. Did you enjoy wearing your school uniform? Do you like it? Huh? Most of you didn't, right? So why did you wear it then if you didn't like it? Why did you wear the school uniform? If you didn't like wearing the school uniform, why did you wear it? Huh? Because you had to. But I thought it was a free country. I thought it was a free country. No, we all do things all the time. 
There's things that we... And what, okay, so what is it when you do something that you don't want to do because you have to? What do you call that? What are you doing? You're... Huh? You, you're submitting, right? I give up what I want. I want to wear these nice clothes. I want to wear this, but I'm going to give up that because, well, that's the rule. Or maybe you do it... Let's think about another situation. Maybe you surrender and you give up because you love somebody. Yeah? I mean, in short, I hope, God willing, that, you know, the sisters here love their husbands. Yeah? And the husbands here love their wives. I'm hoping that's the case. Yeah? So it's normal, isn't it? It's normal. You love your children. You love your children, right? But it's not always you want to give up your day. Maybe you want to give up your weekend. You, maybe you want to play football. Maybe you want to go mountain biking like me. Or maybe, I don't know, whatever it is you want to do. But you know what? You give up some of that time because you love your kids. And you want to do something for them. And you want to make them happy. That you, 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 sometimes you give up because you love someone. You surrender. You submit. You can submit out of love. And sometimes you submit out of fear. Because I'm afraid what's going to happen to me if I don't do this or if I don't do that. And sometimes you do it because, wait a minute, I just know that's the right thing to do. Now if you think about it deeply, think about this, think about this deeply. Can anyone think of any moment in your entire existence when you are not submitting to someone or to something? Think about it. Your entire existence where you are not submitting to someone or something. You, I, I mean, you can't. I'm sorry. <laughs> Whatever you say, you'll think that actually, yes, I am submitting to someone or something. When you're asleep, you're submitting for your need to sleep. That our existence is submission. So what is Islam saying? Think about this. Think about the concept. Or I'm not, I'm not telling you the details. I'm telling you the concept of Islam. If you want to understand Islam, it's the concept that's key. What Islam says is, look, actually, the being that is most worthy of our submission is God. If we submit to someone because we love them, well, God is more worthy of our love. Because whatever we have, ultimately, from goodness, comes from God, ultimately. So God is more worthy of our love. If we submit because we're afraid, well, we should be more afraid of God than anything else because He is more able to punish us than any other being. And if we submit because it makes sense, because it's intelligent, because it's wise, well, who is more wise than God? So therefore, the one that is most worthy of us submitting to is God. So here's the question. How do we submit to God? How do we know the best way to live our life? How can we know what God wants us to do? How can we love God? How can we express our love for God? How can we keep away from the things that God doesn't... That's where the Qur'an comes in. We believe that that's why God has sent books. For example, the Torah to Moses. And the Injil or the Gospel to Jesus. And the Qur'an to Muhammad. These are all... These, these are books or guidance from God to teach us how to live our life in a way that is pleasing to God. That is the essential importance of the Qur'an. That's what it's about. Now if you understand that, as, and as Abu Tayyib said, it's not the actual burning the Qur'an that's the problem. It's not the burning the Qur'an that's the problem. The issue is the insult that is intended. The point is, I want to insult your book. I mean, a Muslim would say, as we said, that's actually one of the ways we've been taught that if we want to dispose of old Qur'ans or torn Qur'ans or something, one of the ways we're allowed to dispose of it is by burning it. And it's not considered to be insulting the Qur'an. But the point is, it's the intent. But the issue here is, you see, for the Muslim, that is ultimately... As if someone is attacking, well, almost the purpose of life itself. 
the whole foundation on which morality and decency and the idea of right and wrong is built on this book and someone wants to insult it because if you look at the essential teachings of the Quran for someone to say it's evil it's an evil book it, honestly it really is absurd because if you look at the essential teachings of the Quran what is it number one there is one God this universe has a creator and there are many verses in the Quran that talk about look at the heavens the earth the alternation of the night and the day look within yourselves look at the animals look at these are all signs that point to a creator an organized systemized universe points to one who has designed it and created it and organized it and systemized it's very simple logical conclusion and this creator can't be the same as the creation this is the basic message message of the Quran about God there's one God God is not like anything in this universe and because God has created the universe and given us life we should worship God we should thank God we should praise God because God has power over everything we should seek help from God that's the basic message of the Quran and God is most wise he knows what's best for us and so when he gives us some guidance and says this is the best way for you to live we'll try to live that way if God says don't drink alcohol it's not because God doesn't want us to have a good time it's because God knows that alcohol is gonna damage us individually and collectively I mean we only need to look at the statistics of what alcohol does how much violence how many death deaths how much abuse in homes how many rapes how much police time is spent looking after people pouring out of pubs and clubs on a Saturday night and a Friday night instead of going and dealing with criminals they have to go and make sure that this person who's so drunk he would drown on his own sick so he has to be looked after is that a good use of police time is that what taxpayers should be spending their money on people who can't control themselves to look after them it's evil where's the logic that marijuana is forbidden and alcohol is allowed they're just as bad as each other there's no particular logic in it it's just a cultural thing it's not scientific so God is not saying don't drink alcohol because I don't want you to have a good time God is saying don't drink alcohol because this is bad for you this is not gonna help you it's not gonna help you be a better human being you're not gonna be better because of drinking alcohol you're not gonna improve the world and make the world a better place by drinking alcohol you're not and it won't make you happy so leave it it'll be better for you it's what the Quran says and this is the case with everything God knows best okay so this is the Quran It's this book of guidance this wisdom from the Creator and that is what the Muslims base their life on that God's guidance so we do our best to follow it and that is the way that the human being will lead a good and a happy and complete life and there is a very very important thing that I want to finish on very very important concept is that the Muslims you see we believe the Quran is the actual speech of God you know in the, for example if you're familiar with the Bible then you'll know for example about the Ten Commandments the Ten Commandments is actually God saying thou shalt not do this and thou shalt not do that here is it's almost as if you could put God in parenthesis you could say this is God clearly saying something Muslims believe the Quran is like that it's actually the speech it's God talking to us it's God actually talking to human beings and therefore that is something very precious that is something we have to hold in the highest respect and highest esteem because when we respect it when we hold it in that, that high esteem that will ensure that we have a very positive attitude towards acting upon it that's the wisdom behind that I always remember a friend of mine 
from the Arabian Peninsula, from actually Dubai. And when he came to my house, if he ever saw the Quran underneath any other book, he would, put it, pit it, he would pick it up and he would put it on top. And I would say to him, Jamal, is that Islam? Does Islam say it has to be like that? Is it, is it forbidden, is it a sin to put other books on top of the Quran? He said, no. He said, it's not a sin. He said, but I just don't like. You know, he didn't like the concept in his mind that any book should be above God's book. Because what God says is, it's just, you understand, it's a linking, it's a concept. The concept that what God says is more important. Put it on top. It's this, it's this connection between what you do with your body and what you feel in your heart. There's a con and by the way, this is, I mean, it's so fascinating if you study psychology and many of the, uh, the research that has been done now into human behavior. This is exactly what they've discovered. There is this very powerful and strong link between your physiology, between how your body is and your state of mind. So even for example, try this, just try it. Totally aside from our conversation, just something to, you know, if you're feeling down, you're feeling a bit depressed, just try this. Make yourself smile. Just make yourself smile. Yeah? Make yourself move like a happy person. Happy people are jolly and they move around and they smile and they're like this, right? And force yourself to be happy and jolly. And you know what you'll find? You will start feeling happy. It's, by the, this is a fact that they found. If you behave in a certain way, you will start to feel that way. This is very important. Okay, and I think if you think about that, then you can see why treating the Qur'an respectfully is very, very important for Muslims. Because the, the way that we physically treat it respectfully is making a link in our mind between the status that we give what this book says in our life. And that, as I said, is what the life of the Muslim is based upon. And it is not religion as you may think of it. It is really a way of living. It's really what our life is about. It's this communication from God to all mankind. And also, by the way, Muslims don't believe the Quran is just for Muslims. We believe it's for everybody. It's a book for all mankind. The Prophet Muhammad is called Rahmatul Alameen. He's a mercy to all, not even the mankind only. Every single living creature the book is supposed to be the Qur'an, a book of mercy. You know what, I'm going to finish on something I think is very simple, but immensely profound. It's profound for me personally, and I think it's profound generally, about the Qur'an. Every single chapter of the Qur'an, every, there's 114 chapters in the Qur'an, right? Every single chapter of the Quran, except one, except one, every chapter begins with this phrase, Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim, which means in the name of God. Allah is not <laughs> the Arab God or the Muslims God. Allah is just the Arabic name for the one God who has created everything. If you open a Bible in Arabic, guess what they call God? In the, in, in the Christian Bible, in Arabic. God is called Allah. Christian Arabs call God Allah. Jewish uh, Jews who speak Arabic, they call God Allah. It's just the Arabic term for God. Like Dieu in French or Gott in German. So, Bismillah. In the name of God. The one God. Ar-Rahman, Ar-Rahim. And what do those two words mean? Ar-Rahman, these are the two names of God. Ar-Rahman is the merciful. Yeah? And this mercy is a type of mercy that has some conditions to it. The Rahmah or the mercy of God, God is merciful to all the creatures. But 
If we disobey God, if we immerse ourselves in disobedience to God, if we constantly behave in a way that degenerates ourselves and our communities, then this rahmah, this mercy is taken away. And it, it's, it's exchanged with punishment. So we wouldn't say that God's mercy is absolute in that sense. No, God is merciful to the, those who take the path of seeking God's mercy. But Ar-Rahim also means merciful, but it's a different type of mercy. It's a constant mercy. Ar-Rahim is a, is a mercy that is constant and is always flowing. And that mercy, as the scholars explain, are for those people who are immersed in that connection with God, who are immersed in living their lives and trying to live their lives in a way that is connected with God. When they live like that, even if they go off tilt now and then, no, still that is a constant mercy of God. So how could anyone, looking at the Qur'an, seeing at the top of every single chapter, Ar-Rahman, Ar-Rahim, Ar-Rahman, the merciful, the mercy giving, how could we say that the Qur'an then is a, you know, a violent book, an evil book? A, 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 no, it's, it's about mercy. God is about mercy. God is about love. God is about forgiveness. God is about repentance. These are the themes that come up again and again and again in the Quran concerning God. And those are also the qualities that Muslims should imbibe into their life. And that is also the quality, my brothers and sisters, I have to say to you, because since most of us are Muslims, that is also the quality that we need to display to others. To people who are not Muslim, where is the quality of mercy? Where is our mercy? Where is our forgiveness? Where is the overlooking of faults? This is the qualities that Muslims should have. These are the qualities that we found manifest and imbibed in the Prophet Muhammad. May God's peace and blessings be upon him. Who was the, his character was the Qur'an. He was the walking Qur'an. And what was he? You find he was so merciful, so forgiving, so kind, so compassionate. This is the example that we need to follow. This is the path that we need to tread. Thank you very much for giving me some of your time, allowing me to share a little bit of my vision. I hope that in some way we've come to a little bit of a closer understanding of the basic concepts of what Islam is about and why the Quran is so important. May the mercy and the blessings and the forgiveness of God be with us all. Jazakallah khair. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.